Good morning to you. I'm Mike Miano, pastor of the Blue Point Bible Church, director of the Power of Preterism Network. And of course, the, this is my, it's my privilege to be here with you this Friday. Uh, again, concluding two weeks of talking about preterism and uh, Genesis creation and all the different prophetic points that we see uh, going through the scriptures. And I know I've been blessed. I trust those of you that have been tuned in, have been here a part of our discussion, have been blessed. And we have a lot to say, a lot still to share. And of course, many different flashback resources and flash forward announcements to share for our flashback Friday, flash forward Friday. So uh, I look forward to sharing some of that with you. However, before doing all of that, Edward, I want to go ahead and say good morning to you and invite you to share some thoughts. And if you don't mind, go ahead and lead us in a word of prayer. Amen. My name is Edward Howell. I'm a member of the Blue Point Bible Church. And I'm also a board member for the Power of Preter Preterism Network. And it's always an honor and privilege to co-host with Pastor Michael Miano. I would like to first um, openly um, apologize for my insensitivity to the bombing uh, of Ukraine. I was unaware of it because I don't have television. I do have a TV, but you know, uh, I just have uh, my uh, movies that I purchase uh, on it. You know, for, you know, because it's a smart TV with artificial intelligence. So I have a library that I have movies in. So I wasn't aware of what was going on. But due to the, the importance of gathering together and the fervent prayers of the saints, you know, and their concern on their face provoked me to look into what was going on with Ukraine. And I saw that they had bombing. But I also saw that uh, it's a great possibility if we were to continue in prayer that the, the Kremlin, you know, they claimed that they would, you know, uh, send a, a delegation to Minsk, uh, Ber Ber Belarus, and talks with uh, Ukrainian uh, leadership that, that hopefully that they will send a delegation and hopefully that the talks will be effective and fruitful to where as, you know, they can, you know, settle the matter so we need to continue to pray for the Ukraine as well as Russia, you know. So now I would like to open us up, open us up in prayer. Heavenly Father, please go before us. Give us clarity of mind, thought, and proper focus that was be what would be said today. And uh, bless Randall Nuss that you know he would teach us with clarity and proper focus and conciseness where, you know, we can glean from it and share with one another and open up dialogue and have fellowship and bless pastor in this regard, you know, in leading this. Um, and I just, you know, thank God that uh, there's a possibility that Russia will send a delegation and have the talks with the leadership of Ukraine. And that maybe that this can be, you know, settled in that, in that fashion. So let us continue praying in that regard. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Thank you, brother. I appreciate that. Of course, I appreciate your humility and honesty in uh, regards to uh, what we're seeing happen. And uh, we do, of course, lift up continued prayers uh, in that regard. Um, what I'd like to just say is uh, we have Randall Nuss with us again. And uh, this is, want to remind everyone, this is two weeks of talking about this topic. So if this is your first time watching this video flash by your Facebook screen, uh, you cannot just take this one video and base, you know, your, your agreement or your disagreement upon the things that are said here. It's important to build a foundation. And that's why we've spent quite a bit of time talking about these things and maybe belaboring, if you will, uh, hermeneutic details that need to be seen and understood uh, as you're entering into Genesis chapter one and two. So, of course, that's my encouragement to you to go back and visit our blog site powerofpreterism.wordpress.com, where we've cataloged not only all of these podcasts, and I've actually done it in a fashion where you can find the ones with Randy, you can find the ones with Tim, or the discussion we had with Jeff uh, in different ways, in different resources, but also each of them include a host of other resources that were either mentioned or alluded to in our program. So again, I, I hope people will go back and look at that. Matter of fact, uh, the Teach Us Tim uh, podcast, I keep saying it wrong, or blog, or Tim Teach Us, uh, the name of the blog. Uh, I had updated that just this morning, and I put notes from yesterday's podcast with Tim, 
And uh, I might remind you, uh, he had talked about the prom uh, promised land of lot presentation that he had done at a conference. And I went ahead and I updated the blog where now you can find the audio for that as well as the PDF file uh, to go along with it. So that's available for you at the power of preterism.wordpress.com. And also, I just wanted to mention the three things, and I'm sure uh, I'm, I'm sure that Randy would agree with these three. And also, just one point about a, a comment we, we made yesterday, and then we want to invite Randy on. Uh, Tim had highlighted three false assumptions that will hinder a healthiest understanding of what is being detailed in these early chapters of Genesis. And what, the first one was that we demand what we are reading is raw history of material events. And Tim said that will hinder you from uh, that demand, that false assumption, uh, that, that presupposition will hinder you from having a healthy understanding of Genesis 1 through 3. Uh, number two, asserting that Adam and Eve are the only humans evolved in, involved in Genesis 1 through 2. And of course, he leaned in quite a bit on that discussion yesterday, where he had highlighted the animals, the beasts of the field, and the ways the prophets used uh, you know, that discussion. I don't know about you. I know that uh, my Bible from Genesis 1 through 2 is filled up with notes and correlations and cross-references of areas you can see this found all throughout biblical literature. And then the third thing uh, was the presupposition that the Genesis creation account is about the material universe. And uh, if you have those three presuppositions, they will hinder you from developing a healthy understanding of what's going on here in Genesis. So I encourage you to challenge that. If you're here tuned into us, we're asking you to take a moment to see it through this lens. Look through the lens and see if this is, is uh, worthy of seeking, searching, studying, and proving. So uh, that's the first thing I wanted to mention. And of course, the, the next thing I just wanted to bring up was uh, we had talked about the question yesterday, what is the benefit of studying covenant creation? And I had highlighted that it's an ongoing conversation in one of the social media forums. And I just wanted to let everyone know that the testimony is being added to. More and more people are commenting and encouraging that discussion that they're seeing the benefit of what we're doing here, what Tim, Jeff, Randy, uh, what many of these men, women, uh, you know, I think of many women that are even involved in creating and fostering this conversation, praise God. And uh, thanks be to God that we're seeing that fruit. Uh, we might call it a fruitful Friday, if you will. Uh, just praising God for what these men and women have done to develop this conversation. So, Edward, I hope that was a good, worthy introduction. And we're, we'll, we'll go ahead and welcome Randy on. Uh, if not, go ahead and share your thoughts. Amen. I'm ready for Randy. Cool. All right, Randy, what's going on, brother? Good morning, guys from Frigid, Kansas. It's 13 degrees here where I'm at in Wichita, Kansas. But I'm delighted to be back with both you two today. And uh, Edward, I really appreciate that that prayer because I'm going to try to be as concise as possible today. Uh, a lot of times I kind of ramble on, but I'll try to curtail uh, my eagerness to talk about things. And uh, one one thing I would like to add to uh, Tim's um, as far as history, having history influencing how we uh, go into Genesis one is that I think uh, we, we should realize that historical things were used as a backdrop. They were used as a backdrop for a lot of this, a lot of this imagery, and a lot of it is prophetic imagery about things to come. However, remember that the, these people lived when the, in the early chapters of Genesis lived in southern Mesopotamia. Southern Mesopotamia was a floodplain. It flooded every year, and so they were able to observe after a flood uh, what happens when, when the water would, would pull away, there was new, new dirt laid down, new land, and eventually they would see some small grass sprout up. And then after some grass, there'd be some larger vegetation, then some animals would creak in and habitate it, then they'd see trees pop up, and then people occupy the land. So the pattern of what they, they had a backdrop for writing about a lot of these prophetic things in Genesis 1. So, so totally... Uh, not allowing history to influence how you view the text is a good good posture. Just realize that that real historical things were functioned as a backdrop for the prophetic writing. So um, th that's all I had to say about that. Is is that what you were looking for there, uh, Michael? Uh, yeah, I, I think again, I think that's important. I think that's something that people do need to consider and and take in. And I appreciate your thoughts in that regard. 
Okay. All right. So with that, I'm going to go ahead and get started for time's sake and just be forewarned. I've, I've got a lot of slides here, but I'm going to click through them quickly. It may seem overwhelming. So I, excuse me. <clears throat> I think the best approach for listeners is to just kind of sit back and chill, hmm. you know, and yeah. kind of soak it in because if you uh, want to jot something down, you can, but if you blink, you might miss something. <laughs> so that's what I mean. So yeah, you know, sit back and chill, jot down, jot down some notes occasionally, but realize I am going to zip, zip through a lot of this stuff pretty quick. I'm going to enable screen sharing. <clears throat> okay, screen sharing is up. And okay, that worked pretty slick. Okay, walking through Genesis 1, it says, A Covenant Creationist Perspective. Notice that subtitle, it is not the Covenant Creationist Perspective. This is a Covenant Creationist Perspective. Uh, these views are only my views. It's just a reflection of how I stepped through. Remember last week, I went through the book of Jonah. Jonah is a real short book. And we applied all of the hermeneutics that I, sh I showed you, how I kind of picked through things and how I kind of come to some conclusions by using those hermeneutics. Uh, this is just me going through Genesis 1. It's, there's so much unpacking that can be done. I only picked four items today to go through, just so it's not so overwhelming. And so these views don't necessarily reflect the views of the authors of being beyond creation science, beyond creation science, or they don't reflect the views of other covenant creationists. This is just purely me talking today. <clears throat> okay, the objective today is... Um, to familiarize Bible readers uh, with some of the symbology, specifically the firmament, fowls, Adam, and the term meat. And some history, there's that word, contained in Genesis 1 using the covenant creation hermeneutic. And uh, the history is actually related, and it's just as a backdrop, okay? Now, here's the hermeneutics. Uh, I suspect I might come back for future video presentations a uh, long time down the road, but, and every time I do, I'm going to go through this list because I think it's so important. If right now the covenant creation is not very standardized, we're kind of going in several different directions, but I really think that this needs to be the entering framework. I mean, uh, try to memorize these items because this is your guidebook and basically your code of honor. All right, so let's try and stick to these. And always honor original audience relevance. Always honor ancient Near East context. Always use scripture to interpret scripture. Always filter out personal bias. Slow down and pay attention to the details, and that's the English. Parse each verse and make comparisons with other verses. That's digging into the English as well as the Hebrew and Greek terms and making comparisons. And lastly, is an important item, always acknowledge that the original writers used specific terms and specific literary structures to convey specific messages. Let's see how this goes. Okay, that worked pretty good. Uh, this is a software program. I'm on a Mac, and this program is called Strong's Concordance. It's available for download in the App Store. It's fairly inexpensive, but I like using it because it's easy to do, and I can, I can click around pretty quickly. But uh, I am going to read every word here, and some of it is going to be uh, pretty quickly, because. but I'm just going to focus on just a few of the words today, all right? Uh, what's important here in Genesis 1-1, in the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. Just remember, it goes right a sheath. Elohim, bara, heaven and earth is Shemayim et Eretz. Uh, it's important to note that Shemayim is indeed a plural term. However, the earth is a singular term, Eretz. And that's how I pronounce it. Other people might call it Eretz. But also, this is bara. Now, Oh, uh, one important thing I wanted to show you is that if you come down here to bara, it's used twice in the Old Testament, meaning to choose. In Ezekiel 21, 19, uh, also thou son of man, which is Adam over here, 
appoint thee two ways what the sword of the king of Babylon may come. Both twain shall come forth out of one land and choose thou a place, choose it at the head of the way to the city. So choose is certainly Barak. A lot of people may not be aware of that. But now I'll switch back to Genesis 1.1. 1, 1. And let's see, let's go back to the program here. All right, heaven and earth. This is why we're here talking about this in the first place. Uh, what brought us here to address this issue about heaven and earth? And, and again, I'm talking to the people who are maybe seeing this for the first time and haven't seen my first two videos on this. But is Matthew 24, 34, 35, where Jesus is speaking. He says, Assuredly, I say to you, this generation will by no means pass away till all these things take place. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will by no means pass away. Right there, Jesus told us that the heaven and earth was going to pass away during his generation. So since physical planet earth is still here, the heaven and earth must be something else. Also, Matthew 5, 18, for assuredly, I say to you, till heaven and earth pass away, one jot or one tittle will by no means pass from the law till all is fulfilled. So here, the law is tied to the heaven and earth and passing away. And also, all is fulfilled is tied to the heaven and earth passing away. So it's important to make all of those connections and see how they're, how they're all interrelated. So we got heaven and earth and law, all is fulfilled. And lastly, Isaiah 51, 16 uh, here Isaiah is talking to Israel, and it's, it's about people. And I have put my words in thy mouth, and I have covered thee in the shadow of mine hand, that I may plant the heavens and lay the foundations of the earth, and say to Zion, thou art my people. That verse makes a direct connection of people to heaven and earth. So, the easiest way to, I wanted to quantify what exactly is heaven and earth. We know there was a temple involved. We know there was a city involved. We know there's a deity involved. We know that there's people involved, worshipers involved. So this is the most concise way I can think of defining what a heaven and earth is in generic terms. It's a covenant system and its members. Remember that. <clears throat> Create versus make. This is getting into the bara versus uh, asa, because create is translated from bara and make is translated from asa. Two very simple words. Uh, there is some standardization in the theology community on what these words mean, but I decided to use kitchen talk and shop talk because every everybody's going to get that. <laughs> and so here is bara. To manufacture something new from scratch. We all know are familiar with that. We can relate to that. The saw is to modify something into a new function. Again, that's not the theology community definitions. That's Randy Ness definitions. However, I think everyone's going to get that. So always keep that in mind when we're talking about these two terms, bara and a saw, differentiating to manufacture something new from scratch or to modify something in existence into a new function. <clears throat> okay, we're going to go one, two to one, five. That's basically uh, a portion of day one. It says, and the earth was without form and void and darkness was upon the face of the deep. And the spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. And God said, let there be light. And there was light. And God saw the light that it was good, and God divided the light from the darkness, and God called the light day, and the darkness he called night, and the evening and the morning were the first day. So the first thing I want to talk about is this face. It's panim. That's how it is, panim. So uh, this deep has a face, and these waters have a face. Waters is multiple. Deep is singular. So uh, another thing I'd like to do is show you where 
face or panim is used. And let me go down here. I found one that's interesting. And it's actually where, where God is talking. Actually, I could probably go there quicker if I navigate this way. Exodus chapter 20, where the Ten Commandments are. And we go to uh, verse 3. Thou shalt have no other gods before me. If you click on me, guess what it is? It is panim. So an easier way to say this verse, the, or the message that's being conveyed here, thou shalt have no other gods before me, is thou shalt have no other gods in my face. All right? So this term panim means a literal face. <clears throat> so remember that, the deep has a face, and the waters is many faces because it's multiple. And the light, there's all kinds of theology out there unpacking what you do with the light. I'm not going to address that today. So uh, I just realized that I'm going to stick to the four terms that I talked about and also the dividing and the darkness. Uh, but here, in the evening and the morning were the first day. Here is a little bit of any &E context about that. <clears throat> evening and morning uh, our current western calendar is midnight to midnight okay and also our functional day starts in the morning and we kind of start chilling out in the evening when the sun goes down that's kind of when we feel like our functional day ends but the day is actually technically in at midnight here however the jewish calendar the day is sunset to sunset very interesting and guess what the jewish calendar is based on the Sumerian calendar, real history, real items that impact the Bible here. So it's actually Sumerian invention. It's extremely ancient. Their days were sunset to sunset, and that's why it's worded like that, and evening and morning. So their, their day consists of first an evening, then the morning. Okay, now we're going to get into day two. That's switching pretty good. All right, uh, let's see here. All right, it starts here in six. Day two starts at verse six. And God said, let there be a firmament in the midst of the waters and let it divide the waters from the waters. And God made the firmament and divided the waters which were under the firmament and the waters which were above the firmament. And it was so. And God called the firmament heaven and the evening and the morning were the second day. So day two was uh, the creation of this, this uh, firmament. So the first thing I want to talk about here is this: how many times this firmament is. It occurs many times. It's rakia, and it divided. It's rakia. In this instance, in fact, it occurs three times in this verse. Firmament there, firmament there, it's rakia. Firmament there, it's rakia. So it's pretty much that every time, just like Earth is Eretz every time. In Genesis 1. So I'm going to switch back. <clears throat> Oops. Whoa. Here we are. We are only eight verses in the Bible, and we've already got one of these. All right. It may not be a big deal, but it's necessarily there. Let's go back and talk about that. <clears throat> Okay, notice in day one, and God called the light day and darkness he called night. And or up here in verse four, he said the light and that it was good and God divided the light. Then day one was closed out. In day two, here's the close out of day two in the evening and morning of the second day. There's no, and God said it was good, applicable to day two. All the other days have it but it's missing from day two. Now, this appears to be an issue with Masoretic text and Bibles that are based on the Masoretic text, because if you pick up a Septuagint, it's got, and God saw it was good in day two. So, and also there's a number of other Bibles out there that are not based on the Masoretic text. So, and that, those Bibles may have, and God saw it was good. But if you've got like a King James or a New King James, or any of the other Bibles based on the Masoretic text, it's missing. So just kind of a Jewish thing for you. I thought I'd, I'd pass along. Uh, but it is something that, that is there nevertheless. 
So let me continue on here. <clears throat> the firmament, Rakia. There's some verses that help us unpack what the Rakia was. Uh, there's all kinds of them. I'm just going to use three. Psalm 19.1, the heavens declare the glory of God, and the firmament, Rakia, showeth his handiwork. So this Rakia was a showpiece. It was to impress people. And so we've got to show his handiwork. Those are important. And here's a verse that describes showing the handiwork a little bit more than Job. And it's remember that thou magnify his work, which men Enosh behold. Every man Adam may see it. Man Enosh may behold it afar off. This is talking about temple architecture. For example, the court of the Gentiles where they, are, they can worship from afar and the indigenous worshipers can actually get a little closer. That's why the Adam may see it. However, the Enosh or converted foreigners may be behold or afar off. So this uses similar terminology, magnify his work, which men behold, sort of clarifies which showeth his handiwork up in Psalm 19.1 is. And the last verse I want to use is Psalm 150.1. It says, praise ye the Lord, Praise God in his sanctuary. Praise him in the firmament, Rakia, of his power. So this verse makes a direct link of the Rakia to a sanctuary. So, so now we're starting to get a feel how this firmament in Genesis 1 is actually related to temple architecture. So now we're going to go back to the Strongs again. Okay, now we're going to talk about the dividing. Okay, the second, days two is closed out at nine, and God said, let the waters under the heaven be gathered together into one place, and let the dry appear. Land is inserted by the King James translator, so it's italicized here, and th so the dry, which is the Yabesha, appeared, and God called the dry earth, which is Eretz, or Eretz and the gathering together of the waters called he sees which is yam and god saw that it was good uh, so the important things i want to talk about here is the dividing of these these waters and uh this this is where i really spent a lot of time coming up with some diagrams when i was early on when i was studying this uh, let's see here okay um uh, under, oh, uh, I wanted to go back. I need to go back, get out of that. So if you click on these terms, so like, and God called it right, let's see, let's have the other one place. Now I can get it to move. It divided the waters and made the firmament, divided the waters which were under. See where my cursor is, I'm going to click on under. It's Tekath. And so I was scrolling through alternative words for under, and sure enough, it says for, uh, like in Exodus 21, 26, if, and if a man smite the eye of his servant or the eye of his maid that it perish, he shall let him go free for his eye's sake. So here we got, it's the same Hebrew word, but it's talking about some kind of ownership is what that term is the point I'm trying to make. It's ownership. And then similar, if I need to find above, where is above? Above the firmament right here is al, A-L, above. And this was interesting. It, it, here's against. All right, I go to Chronicles 32, 19. And they spake against the God of God of Jerusalem, against the God of Jerusalem, which is Al, as the gods of the people of the earth, which were the work of the hands of Adam. So here people were speaking against Al, the God of Jerusalem. So I thought that was that was very interesting. And so uh, that's what I wanted to emphasize there. I'm going to go back to the presentation. 
So what I came up with is that when you see under, the English is four. Same Hebrew words, but under equals four, above equals against. So under the firmament and above the firmament is the same as for the firmament or heaven and against the firmament or against the heaven. For the heaven or against the heaven. <clears throat> Shapes and concepts. Now, like I said, I spent a lot of time when I was really trying to parse this apart, removing all presuppositions, the way I discovered to be absolutely as neutral as possible is to just use geometric shapes uh, on a graphic. And this is, this is how it ended up working uh, because I was a B B1 bomber pilot in the US Air Force. And our mission was tactically was to uh, fly low level terrain following for a certain amount of time. And that low level route always culminated in a bombing run. And so we flew as a pilots on our knee, on, our, on the top of our thigh here on one side uh, was a chart, a chart. And on that chart was depicted geometric shapes. Mm -hmm. And the center line of the routing was always lines. The turn points were always circles. And the initial points for the bomb runs were always squares. And the targets were always depicted as a triangle. Now these are intangible abstract concepts which depict and represent real tangible things. In fact, they had real tangible colossal results as shown here and here. So this is an example of how you can apply abstract concepts to come up with a real result that's that's has a lot of impact so i wanted to draw the heaven how do i draw the heaven i said i want to look at it from the side first so i came up with this rectangle i just plotted this just like this we're looking this is a two-dimensional view looking at it from the side on what's going on in this terminology and so here is the label the heaven here's waters under the and here's the waters above the heaven. And I looked at that and I thought, what I'm trying to achieve with these uh, geometric shapes is determine relationships. Determine relationships that are trying to be expressed in this terminology in Genesis. And that's where I think the biggest roadblock is and kind of what this is trying to say. They default to literal historical physical things because that's easy, but without really trying to determine what the relationships between entities are that the Genesis 1 narrative is trying to achieve. So this, this just strange to me. Uh, maybe it did strange, but this is based on the English and uh, there's alternative English words we can use look better. So sure. I moved the heaven up to the top and I drew waters under the heaven and I drew waters not under the heaven. I said, okay, now this is looking like something that makes sense. This is showing a relationship here. Here we have a heaven, waters for the heaven, waters against the heaven, or not for the heaven. <clears throat> and then the uh, before that, then these waters under the heaven, it was only the waters under the heaven that was divided. The waters outside were not touched. So the waters under the heaven were, were gathered in the one place called the sea. And then there's the earth or the erets. So, and then I said, okay, now I want to get a better picture at this heaven, earth, and sea thing and see what's going on here. In order to do that, I got to go to a top view or view from the top down. So that was a challenging challenge to do that. A lot of people have done that, but in order to depict properly depict the earth and the sea, uh, from the top down, they have to be done in an omnidirectional fashion, which means all directions like a circle. So here's an earth. Here again, we're looking from the top down in geometry. This vantage point is called the z-axis, but here's the earth and here's the sea gathered together in one body. So this, I think this best communicates what the verbs or what the uh, terms in Genesis was trying to get us to look at. And then here's the heaven. I'm going to overlay a heaven that's transparent. 
that we can still see the earth and the sea. So you look at the heavens. So what's depicted here is an earth and the sea under the heaven, or a better way to think of it is under the jurisdiction of this heaven. Mm. Now I'm going to remove that opaqueness so we can see it more clarity. Just realize the heaven is still there. Now I'm going to bring in the waters that were not under the heaven. So now we're starting to get a better feel for relationships. And if anybody has ever studied the ancient Near East and the iota of the ancient Near East, they're going to immediately recognize this as resembling this. What this is, is an artist rendition of an ancient Near Eastern Sumerian city-state. Way, way back, extremely ancient. In fact, uh, this is a pre-flood city because there's no superstructure in the middle. The superstructures were the uh, ziggurats that resembled the step pyramids, which actually functioned as the temple, but those didn't arise until after the, after the flood. But we see here an inner part of this city, which is closest to this body of water here, and it's got some protection around it. Uh, there's some separation here. And then here's, uh, no, notably in the ancient Near East, this is probably where all the affluent had their dwellings and all the shops and money transactions occurred. Outside that inner wall were probably like where the laborers dwelled and the, the lower class of the people because they only had one level of protection, the outer wall for them. Then came the outer wall. And in these ancient Eastern city-states, each one had its own deity and the citizens worshiped that deity, and there was a priesthood and a ruler. So that's, that's how these societies were set up. And um, the priests actually controlled the water uh, that went through here. The, the priest, if you wanted water into your dwelling, you paid the temple, just like we pay for our water today. And if you wanted to plant crops outside in, in the attached land here, then a channel was dug to your field and you had to pay again to tap into that water. Now these city states were built near rivers, not right next to them because of the flooding, the frequent flooding. And so they always had to dig these river channels, channels to divert water through. And a lot of times uh, every flood, every year it would flood these river channels or river patterns would change patterns, move away. And that's why a lot of these cities died out because the water went away from it and they couldn't dig any more channels to bring the water back. But, and the deity was considered of the, this city was considered to own the land. That's why you basically paid rent to the temple. So religion was very big business as the, the central sanctuary temple was the center of commerce for each one. Now, what was disputed were the outer regions, uh, some, especially in between city states, because uh, they're often fused over that, but but some of this nearby land was often associated with the deity ownership. So now there's a narrative in Proverbs. Remember Proverbs 8, where, oh, where it talks about how wisdom was with God in the beginning. And it's all about wisdom. So I'm going to go through three verses here that, that really depict the finishing touches. Because the finishing touches on building a city-state is determining your boundary lines out here on the outer regions. So Proverbs 8, 29 through 31, it goes like this, 29. This is wisdom talking now. When he gave to the sea his decree that the waters should not pass his commandment, when he appointed the foundations of the earth. Then I was by him as one brought up with him, and I was daily in his delight, rejoicing always, before him, rejoicing in the habitable part of his earth, and my delights were with the sons of Adam. So I think that helps clarify the situation a little bit of what we might be looking at in some of this terminology here. Prophetic, yes, about future things, yes, but also using real history as a backdrop. Hmm. So let's, now let's go back to the concordance. Now we're going to read, that's days three, four, and five. We're going to race through those pretty quickly. Let's see, we did the waters and evening, morning, the second day. Now we're going to start the third day. 
And God said, let the waters under the heaven be gathered together in one place, let dry land appear. And it was so. And God called the dry land earth and the gathering together of the waters he called seas. And God saw that it was good. And God said, let the earth bring forth grass, the herb yielding seed, and the fruit tree yielding fruit after his kind, whose seed is in itself mm -hmm. upon the earth. And it was so. And the earth brought forth grass and herb yielding seed after his kind, and the tree yielding fruit, whose seed is, was in itself after his kind. And God saw that it was good. I think the King James translators were on to something by using these prepositions such as his, his kind, when talking about vegetation imagery. Now, also, what I want to bring up here is that this, the filling of the heaven, earth, and sea begins in verse 11, and a literary structure is revealed in 11 and 12. In other words, we have a preceding verse where God says he's going to do something, and then a successor verse where the thing happens. Uh, that happens in but almost every instance except for one, and we'll talk about that when I get to it. So, and anyhow, God said, let the earth bring forth, and guess what? The earth brought forth. So the Eretz successfully achieved what they were ordered to do, on, or what it ordered, was ordered to do. It brought forth the items. That was day three. Day four, and God said, let there be lights in the firmament of the heaven to defy the light from the day and from the night, and let them be for signs and for seasons and for days and years, and let them be for lights in the firmament of the heaven to give light upon the earth. And, and it was so, and God made two great lights, the greater light to rule the day and the lesser light to rule the night. He made the stars also, and he set them in the firmament of the heaven to give light upon the earth. That is stated twice. The mission of the light of the luminaries was to shine their light upon the earth. It says that in verse 15 and again in verse 17. Notice that uh, that earth is Eretz. The yam is noticeably absent. So this defines a relationship, not something physical, but it's something intangible like a relationship between the luminaries and the Eretz. Uh, this light is only for the Eretz. Remember that picture looking from the top down uh, there was the earth in the middle and the sea surrounding it, yet the heaven had the jurisdiction over both of those things, yet the, the heaven or the rakia only shined as light on the Eretz. Always remember those details. Okay, and God saw that it was good, and the evening or morning were the fourth day. Now let's go to day five. And God said, let the waters bring forth abundantly the moving creature that hath life, and fowl that may fly above the earth in the open firmament of heaven. And God created the great whales and every living creature that moveth, which the waters brought forth abundantly after their kind, and wing, every wing fell after his kind, and God saw that it was good. So here again, the preceding verse is verse 20. Uh, God said, let's do this. Or he ordered the waters to bring forth abundantly these things, and the waters came through. They were successful in bringing forth abundantly these characters that were called for. And God blessed them, saying, be fruitful and multiply and fill the waters of the seas. Let fowl multiply in the, in the earth and the evening and the morning were the fifth day. Now, now this is the imagery I'm going to select to talk about here is the fowl. The fowls is oath. And the, the Strong's definition is a bird covered with feathers, or rather as a covering, often collectively bird flying fowl. So although that's technically correct, remember the Strong's does not account for metaphorical use of terms uh, most of the time. So, uh, so we're, we read through day five, and I want to go back and talk about that fowl. <clears throat> All right. Fowls, the, the terminology in Genesis 1 describes the fowls. If you follow it closely, uh, they originate, they come from the sea, and they fly across the face of heaven and then land in the earth, and they were blessed to multiply in the earth. So here are the details about that. They originate in the sea. They fly across the heaven. They arrive in the earth and they are blessed to multiply. So 
So even from the text alone, we can define what a foul is in general terms. And what a foul is, is a character in transition. Foul is a character in transition. <clears throat> Always remember that throughout all Old Testament and New Testament, that's the character in transition. Now we're going to unpack that a little bit. Since they, the fowls originated in the sea, the fish are pertinent to the discussion. So let's talk about some, some Bible verses about the fish here. Here Jesus is talking in Matthew 4, 19, and he said unto them, follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. So here fish are the men. In Habakkuk 1, 14, and makest man Adam as the fishes of the sea, as the creeping things that have no ruler over him. This is Habakkuk prophesying when the Chaldeans were going to come and plunder Jerusalem and take everything away that everybody knew. It, they were going to make the Adam turn them back into, ab absorbed into the sea as fish and creeping things, which is a very low order in the society as a creeping thing, which have no ruler. So, and then Jeremiah 4.28 and Jeremiah is also prophesying when the Babylonians are going to come. And he's commenting on the condition of Jerusalem and the temple after the plundering. He says, I beheld, and lo, there was no man Adam, and all the birds oaf of the heavens were fled. So here's an instance where it was not fowls, but it's still oaf uh, defined as birds. Now, there were still people there because the invaders were there. And there still had to be little birds there because they they live everywhere. It's just that these this, the Adam and the fowls or the birds of heaven were unique to the Yahwist. They were people and they were all in captivity in Babylon. And lastly is Ezekiel 39, 17. And thou, son of man, or son of Adam, thus saith the Lord God, speak unto every feathered fowl and to every beast of the field, assemble yourselves and come gather yourselves on every side to my sacrifice that I do sacrifice for you, even a great sacrifice upon the mountains of Israel that ye may eat flesh and drink blood. This is obviously talking about the Messiah, Jesus prophesying about the day. And he's talking to people. He, God is telling Ezekiel, uh, son of Adam, speak to the fowls and the beasts and assemble yourselves. So, and we know from uh, other verses or other other studies that we've done that be, which we'll talk about also later in this presentation, that beasts and fowls were basically foreigners, and that Jesus also came for the foreigners. So this is a very profound prophetic verse, which kind of helps that. And we're going to talk about this: eat flesh, drink blood particularly where Jesus is involved when we're talking about terms with uh, those types of relationships. Now, here's some verses about sojourners in the law that sounds ghastly familiar to, remember we said the fowls were a character in transition. A verse about the sojourner, ex Exodus 12, 48, and he shall be as one that is born in the land, Eris. So this, the sojourner is not born in the land, but they arrive in the land and shall be uh, just like the ones from the land, the earth. In Exodus, the next very next verse is verse 49, 12, 49. One law shall be to him that is homeborn and unto the stranger that sojourneth among you. Now, slow down and look at the details here. The stranger and sojourner are carved out as separate from the homeborn, yet one law is going to apply for everyone. So that's kind of the theme of the Old Testament law is that it applied to everybody, but there was lots of segregation in that Old Covenant law. And so just by, you can see where this comma is that, that makes sense and it makes that differentiate, differentiation. But this is talking about sojourners. And another verse that helps unpack this more is Leviticus 19.34. But the stranger that dwelleth with you shall be unto you as one born among you, and thou shalt love him as thyself, for ye were strangers in the land of Egypt. I am the Lord your God. And finally, in Numbers 15, 26, and it shall be forgiven to all the congregation of the children of Israel, 
and the stranger that sojourneth among them, seeing all the people were in ignorance. There again, slow down, pay attention to the details. There's things are carved out separately. The congregation of the Israel is one entity. The next entity is the stranger or the sojourners. All right, they are carved out as separate. However, they are all the, all the people comprise the two groups and all shall be forgiven because they were all under the same law. So are you kind of seeing the, the relationships that's explained or actually made clear to us if you look sl slowly and you can see it, there's relationships among these different classes of people, different groups of people. So the conclusions we can come to about the fouls is that a foul is a character in transition from one covenant status to another. A foul is initially a fish. A fish is a candidate for conversion to Yahweh. Fowls migrate from the sea, Yam, to the land, Eretz. Fowls pass through the heaven on their way to the land. This is the indoctrination. This is learning the law. This is learning uh, how to do things right. So you don't end up getting yourself hurt or making yourself poor by having to pay a bunch of fines to the temple. And, and so fowls multiply in the land, Eretz, to grow the body of Yahweh. And the most profound conclusion of all from all of this unpacking is that Genesis 1.22 is a command to grow the body of Yahweh with foreign converts. Right there, foreigners have always been a part of the body of Yahweh from the very beginning. So that's what Genesis 1.22 is. It's an order, grow this body of believers and let the foreigners come and be with you. Amen. Sure. All right, switch to the Strong's. Here we go back. We're going to talk about <clears throat> 24th through 28th. So that was the fifth day. Now we're in day six. This was a big day. Uh, and God said, let the earth bring forth the living creature after his kind, cattle and creeping thing, and beast of the earth after his kind. And it was so. And God made the beast of the earth after his kind and cattle after their kind and everything that creepeth upon the earth after his kind. And God saw that it was good. Even though God said that it was good, I'm seeing a clear failure here on the part of the Eretz <coughs> because God said, let the Eretz bring forth living creature, cattle, beast. But God ended up having to make them a saw. So I haven't quite figured out yet what the prophetic meaning is of that but this relationship here between verse 24 and 25 is i'm seeing a clear failure of the eretz in day six to bring forth the beast the creature the things um yes yeah the beast the cattle and living creature which is basically it's the che ke is what that is the main point, point there so Maybe, maybe my clue light will come on later uh, as I get through more scripture about that, or maybe even Tim Martin may even know uh, what that might be talking about. But that's just a noticeable difference that I saw. Hmm. All right. Now we're going to get to the Adam. And God said, let us make man, Adam, in our image after our likeness and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the fowl of the air and over the cattle and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. So God created man in his own image, own is inserted, in the image of God created he him, male and female created he them. Now, if you read that all the time, very fast, like I just did, you're going to miss a whole bunch of stuff that this is going on. Uh, first of all, this, remember I said the literary structure usually had a preceding verse followed by a successor verse where God says they're going to do something and then they do it. In this instance, um, I disagree with that in this case because I'm very convinced, and I'll show you how I came to my conclusion on this, that this make a saw in verse 26 is a different entity than the created Adam in verse 27. Now this is going to get really interesting. So 
Um, I'm going to go slow and I'll show you how I did this. Okay, Asa versus Bara, Adam. Okay, yeah. Oh, I need to back up. I need to go back to what I was talking about. I'm sorry about that. Go back to the Strongs here. So the first thing I want to do is look into this verse 26, make the differences between this make and create it. I'm going to use, let's go to chapter five, verse one and two. Now, uh, verse one says, this is the book of the generations of Adam in the day that God created man, Adam, and the likeness of God made he him. So the first thing I want to bring up is that anytime you see in the day, right there in the day, that is a date that this inscription was made on a tablet in the day that God created man. That is a date. So uh, I'm, we don't necessarily need to include that in what I'm exegeting here, uh, but just realize that in the day that God created man is a date. That's one. Also in verse two is another one in the day when they were created. So that's also a date. Here are two different um, links. We're linking to two different things. So what if we eliminate in the first one, in the day that God created man, what's left is in the likeness of God made he him. So made is a saw. And sure enough, if we go back to, to verse 26, it was the Asa Adam, and they had the likeness. Notice verse 27, there's no likeness. So that way we can use uh, 5.1 as pointing back to Genesis 1.26 specifically. And this is the book of the generations of Adam. This tells people that all these things were written down in a book, like on a tablet, before these were ever transcribed onto parchment or whatever medium they had. So... Genesis 5.1 points back to Genesis 1.26. And then Genesis 5.2, male and female created he them, and he blessed them and called their name Adam. Male and female only appears in one Genesis 1.27. And also it terms created he them. So here we have bara. And then, of course, here's the date and the day that they are created. So we can discard that as a date. But what's important is bara, male and female, only occurring in 127. So God created man in his own image, and here's the male and female. So we've got Genesis 5.1 and 5.2 also separating the bara and the Asa. That's the conclusion from that. Now let's go into Genesis 6. Okay, here, here God is lamenting over the situation before he brings on the flood and says, uh, in verse 6, chapter 6, 6, and it repented the Lord that he had made man, Adam, on the earth, Eretz, and it grieved him in his heart. So this is made a saw. And in the next verse, and the Lord said, I will destroy Adam, whom I have created, Barah, from the face of the, it was his panim, Adama. The Adama is not the Eretz. And both man and beast and the creeping thing and fowls of the air for it repenteth me, I have made them. So, so it's very apparent to me here that Genesis 6 6 also points back to the Adam that were Assad in Genesis 126. And Genesis 6 7 points back to Genesis 127, which were the created or Barah Adam. Now, and also notice the difference in the scale uh, of, of the threat here. The first one is he re, it repented him that he assad Adam. So the Genesis 127, he just, it just repented him. But the 128, bara Adam, he wanted to destroy them, obliterate them. Okay. So, so there's a differentiation there. And then finally, the last we'll go to Genesis 9. 
uh, Genesis 9, 6, here it is. Whoso sheddeth man's blood by man shall his blood be shed for in the image of God made he man. Now man, every time is Adam, okay? All three instances, it's Adam. So what this is telling us, uh, this is a little off the subject, but it says, whoso sheddeth Adam's blood by an Adam shall his blood be shed for in the image of God made a saw he Adam. So in other words, if anybody kills an Adam, an Adam is going to kill them because the Adam are God's people. That's what that verse is saying. So, and because this is uh, made a saw, this also ties back to Genesis 1:26, And this also tells us what the survivors were of the flood. The survivors were the Assad Adam and the bara adam genesis 127 that was destroyed so now i can go back to that presentation and we can show those links there this is a chart that describes it also you didn't have to take notes for all that i was just showing you how i kind of traced through we basically did some laser cutting <laughs> some precise laser cutting but we we achieved it it, to achieve the goal, which is to clarify what Genesis 126 and 27 is. We got the Asad Adam in, is in Genesis 126, is linked to Genesis 5.1, is linked to Genesis 6.6, 6, and also linked to Genesis 9.6. The Bara Adam is Genesis 127, linked to Genesis 5.2, linked to Genesis 6.7. Very different terms. So, <clears throat> so that is the justification for saying Genesis 126 and 127 are talking about two different instances. Now, so what exactly was destroyed? So there was a remnant on the ark, there was a family. Uh, so what, what ended, something ended after the flood. And I thought long and hard about this. And finally, my clue light came on. Uh, remember, there was a long period of time where the Yahweh didn't have a king. And in fact, so what was destroyed here was the era of priest-king rulers for the Yahwists, all right? And here's the 10 pre-flood patriarchs here. And these have been referred to as priest-kings in the theology community in various locations. But what, what God destroyed was this tradition of having priest-king designate for the Yahwist. And the reason being, because the post-flood dispersion was coming up, uh, basically what built the Genesis 10, the theology community calls that the table of nations, uh, was going to, to be very vast. This, everything that happened up to this point, Genesis 1, 6 through 9, is limited to southern Mesopotamia. It was a very uh, tiny kingdom. It was easy to have one person uh, running the show for all that. Now, uh, the Japhethites were going to move north all the way up to the Mediterranean, north of the Mediterranean. The Shemites were going to move north and east uh, out towards where the Assyrian and all that territories. And the Ham was going to go south to, into uh, through Canaan and into Egypt. That is a big pill to swallow. So, all right, it is not practical at all to have a king or a single ruler. So we're just going to go to uh, localized, basically decentralized control of the Yahweh's community. No more priest kings. That's what was destroyed. Uh, also, talking about the law here. Remember in my last presentation, I brought up the fact that Paul, the Apostle Paul, was talking about uh, Galatians 3.28, there is neither Jew nor Greek, there is neither slave nor free, there is neither male nor female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. He's prophesying about the time where the old covenant law was going to pass away. And that's what this is. There's going to be no more legal uh, terminology to create segregation among people. Uh, when this law goes away, the segregation will be gone, uh, you know, provided you're a Christian. And so uh, he just picked out some terminology to describe the entire 613 uh, law code. And then he does it again in Colossians 3.11, where there is neither Greek nor Jew, circumcised nor uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave nor free, but Christ is all and in all. So here again, he's talking about the entire law code 
but just using a few select terms out of it. Also, the words for man, all right? Uh, this is Adam is H120. This is typically used throughout scripture. Our three main words, there's other words that are used to a less, lesser extent, but it's mainly these three, Adam, H120, Ish, H376, and Enosh, H582. Uh, these are all collective terms. In other words, uh, in fact, Adam isn't used as a proper name until later in scripture, but in Genesis 1, it's always the collective or tribal term. This is like Israel. It's a term like Israel is. You can refer to one person. You can call them Israel. You can say, oh, he is an Israelite or an entire tribe of people. So, However, in Genesis 1, it's only Adam. There were no Ish created in Genesis 1. There were no Enosh created in Genesis 1. The only one that was created in the Genesis 1 creation was this Adam. Now we see these other terms appear later in scripture. So the reasonable person has to ask themselves, where did they come from? Okay. Now let's go back to the Strong's and wrap up those verses. Okay, so uh, the final conclusions that I came to here about Genesis 126 and 127. Genesis 126, and God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness, let them have dominion over the fish of the sea. And what this dominion is, is segregation in the society. This is the top tier people group in the society over the fish of the sea and over the fowl of the air, over the cattle and over every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. This is uh, the Adam that worked in capacities that to represent God because they required to have the image to represent God. And one of the note of that is a little bit of a &E context there is that typically the ruler of a city state uh, represented a deity. They were considered to have the image of the deity of that city state. For example, the Egyptian ruler Cleopatra claimed to be the image of Isis, the goddess Isis. So that's just a little bit of any context here with referring to this image. And Genesis 27 is so God created man in his own image and the image he created he him, male and female created he them. Uh, a technique in the theology community or Bible studiers use is, is they kind of break up verses like here, we've got a comma after, so God created man in his own image. We would call that 27A. And in the image of God created he, him, semicolon, that would be 27B. And male and female created he, them, period, that would be 27C. So what is created here uh, is, so God created man in his own image. That's the priest-king lineage. Right there is that's when that was recreated. In the image of God created he, him, uh, if we notice that created, bara also means choose. Look in Ezekiel 21 and 19. I mentioned that already, uh, choose. So 27a is the creation of the line of priest kings, which is an intangible, not a specific person, just a concept. The second thing that was created was the choosing or selection of a ruler. And then the last thing, male and female created he them. This is the creation of the old covenant law. These are male and female. There are only two terms of it. Those two terms, just like Paul, only used a few terms to represent the entire law code. We have been asked for years when, if you say Adam had the law, when was that old covenant law created? This is the old covenant law that passed away in A70, AD 70. Right here it says when they were created at this instant, Genesis 1, 27C, there's the answer. Okay. Okay, now reading on, <clears throat> and God blessed them and God said to them, be fruitful and multiply, replenish the earth, subdue it, have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the fowl of the air and over every living thing that moveth upon the earth. And God said, behold, I have given you every herb bearing seed, which is upon the face of all the earth and every tree and which is the fruit of a tree yielding seed to you. It shall be for meat and to every beast of the earth, 
and to every fowl of the air and everything that creepeth upon the earth wherein there is life i have given every green herb for meat and it was so and god saw everything that he had made and behold it was very good in the evening and the morning with a sixth day and it's closed out so so I remember that the, the item that were blessed to increase and multiply were the fish of the sea, the fowls, and this atom. There were several things that were created, bara in Genesis 1, and there were several other things that were made, asa in Genesis 1. There were several things that were neither. So several people have made charts related to that. But what I wanted to talk about here is this meat. Meat is oak law. And what I'm seeing here is these verses where it told the Adam what they could use for meat was herb bearing seed and every tree. And the next verse is to every beast of the earth and fowl of the air and creepeth upon the earth or uh, the unclean or unclean or, or foreigners, converted foreigners, <clears throat> they got the green herb. So can you see the elevation imagery used in what they had access to the atom which had the dominion got the trees taller uh, and the the fruit tree yielding seed and also the herb bearing seed that insinuates a taller plant they're going to get however the more lowly are limited to the green herb mm -hmm. so also note green herb this came out of nowhere this was never created or made this is the first occurrence of the green herb so it just just popped out so <clears throat> So what the purpose of these two verses are is establishing segregation and it's establishing an essential relationship that each group uses with another entity. So let me go into that. I know that's a lot of fancy words, but uh, <clears throat> okay, fruit, when you see terms like this, fruit, bread, meat, eat, feed, etc. All right, not all the time, but I've noticed that a lot of the time, especially in this prophetic imagery, that what these items are refer, what they do is they establish a relationship, okay? They establish essential relationships are what the use of this term is. So we saw meat, meat used, the atom are supposed to use the tree and herb bearing seed as meat. And the more lowly characters were, would use the green herb for meat. <clears throat> now let's unpack that meat or eating a little bit more. Remember Peter's vision in Acts 10, uh, he was on a rooftop and had a vision where God was telling him to eat uh, creeping things, beasts, and fowls. You know, beasts, fowls, and creeping things, which is the same imagery. <clears throat> and he said, no, I don't, I don't eat anything that's unclean. And he explains the meaning of this later in Acts 10, okay, I figured out my dream. Here's what it is. And it says, you know how unlawful it is for a Jewish man to keep company with one or go to one of another nation. But God has shown me that I should not call any man common or unclean. So the beasts, fowls, <clears throat> and creeping things in the dream were foreigners, unclean, and common. That's how, how Peter flat out explains that to us. Now, the most use of prophetic imagery in all of scripture, this is, this is just fascinating, is the manger, all right? The manger. Now, uh, here, this is a real manger that was uh, uncovered by archaeologists from ancient Israel. Now, you can see it's raised a little bit, and what it is is a manger is a great term that means it's a livestock feeding trough is what it is. And uh, I also suspect that these were different level heights. If, if you were parked in an elitist part of town, your animal wouldn't have to stoop down so low to eat the grains or whatever is put in it. And this one is a pretty high one. So this must have been for uh, outside an, an affluent establishment. But they would put the feed and the hay in, in the manger here. And so the animals come. Now, literal beasts would come feed out of these mangers. And so by putting Jesus, with the writer of the narrative, putting Jesus in a manger is incredibly prophetic because not only uh, did Jesus come to rejoin the Northern and Southern kingdoms, he came 
for the foreigners, unclean and common as well. That's what the manger pictures, at least to me. So, and here's, Jesus even says so right here in John 6, 57, as the living father sent me and I live because of the father. So he who feeds on me will live because of me. So now hopefully that explains a lot better this whole term about meat in Genesis 1. Now, uh, filling the heaven, earth, and sea. Now we're getting into some gee whiz things that, that uh, you may have never noticed, but these are some things that I noticed. But I went through them when, in, when they start being filled in Genesis 1, 11. Uh, here they are in order of occurrence. Uh, before I talk about that, though, I need to mention the prophetic numbers in the Bible were typically 3, 6, 7, 10, 40, and 1,000, and also 12. And the 12 uh, typically pointed to the 12 tribes of Israel. Uh, that's what a lot of people think. There's all kinds of occurrences of 12 in Scripture. But here, here are the entities that fill the heaven, earth, and sea when they start occurring in Genesis 1:11 as in order of occurrence. Grass, herb yielding seed, fruit tree, greater light, lesser light, stars, sea creatures, fowls, beasts, cattle, creeping things, and Adam. Guess how many that is? 12. Now, that is the major prophetic writing in all of Genesis 1 that tends to slip by everybody. And the next thing, this is kind of a fun thing to do. Uh, after the presentation, go to any, to any computer, iPad or whatever, open up the browser, the web browser, and type in the Google search window, how many cities in ancient Sumer? Guess what the answer is that you get? 12. All right, we, the, uh, we have all of the 2009, 2009 uh, Covenant Creation Conferences in a YouTube channel called Bible Mysteries Explained on YouTube. So just go to Bible Mysteries Explained and you can see where a lot of those initial conference videos are. And then on Facebook, we have Covenant Creation Discussion Forum where you can come join us and study with other like-minded individuals to try to learn some of these techniques and, and unpack some things you might have had questions with too. So that is how I go through Genesis 1. There's an enormous amount of other imagery available in, in Genesis 1. My goodness, like I said, the light and the darkness is just, and, and, and all of the animal imagery, all the vegetation imagery, you can just spend, you could spend an entire career on that one short chapter just trying to unpack it all. But anyhow, the, the bottom line, I just want to leave, it's just tremendously prophetic, uh, a lot of things are explainable in the backdrop for a lot of that prophecy are real historical things that the writers observed and had a perspective on. So with that, that's the end of that presentation. And I will go ahead and stop screen sharing. And I'll come back to you full screen. So All right there you are. Hi, there I am. <laughs> well I have to say, you know, one thing I will say is I appreciate how you began the presentation where you offered up the, you know, the, the encouragement that, or the, you know, the reminder that this is a covenant creationist's perspective. Now I say that because there was a lot of things that obviously you've said that I've heard before I've read before I agree with. Uh, there were some other things that I thought were brought out that may even go against some things that I've believed before or thought before or, or studied out or even taught before. So uh, for me, you know, this was great because I did, you know, take some notes. I, I went against your encouragement there okay. to sit back and relax, but um, I did. And I understood the, the point why you said that, because as I've often said, when I used to listen to Tim's lectures uh, on the, the Covenant community website, that's what it would be. I'd have to go back and listen again and again. And you really have to force yourself to begin to picture, picture these things and, and, you know, really allow them to go into place as you're understanding the narrative. So uh -huh. I appreciated that. I thought you brought out some really great stuff. So I thank you. And uh, yeah, Edward, uh, I don't know what your, your summarized thoughts are. Um, what I do want to say to everyone is Randy, before you leave, I'm going to ask if you could just let us know a way that people can communicate with you best. 
And that being the re reason I'm saying that is we're not gonna open up for Q&A today. Uh, we're a little over the time. Uh, however, uh, what we are going to do is hope that we'll have you back as you alluded to, and we'll continue this conversation in weeks to come uh, as we welcome on some other, uh, other guests. And also, I guess a good reason for this break will be to encourage you to study these things through. <laughs> really think them through so. well, well, I would recommend just uh, having me to join the Covenant Creation Discussion Forum and they can ask questions there, or they could use the the messenger app to try to get in touch with me. You know, I'm I'm very sorry for going over the time. When when I turned my head, I was looking at the clock every time like that. So I, I'm very sorry, but it but it was very uh, a lot to go over. But let, listen, I very much appreciate you letting me go through that. I I just wanted just like I did with Jonah last week. I wanted to show you how I go through Genesis one. So that's what that's all about. Oh, hey, I, I totally appreciate it. You know, again, we're, we're pretty liberal here with the time. Um, you know, I, I did see someone raise their hand. If you don't mind, I'll, I'll unmute Edward, if you don't mind as well. I'll unmute one mic and we'll uh, ask for a question there uh, okay. and allow one question. I figured that was nice since I saw the hand raised. Please, please. All right. Hey, Rod. Hey, yeah, Randall. Hello. Um, it, for those of us that don't do Facebook, is there an alternative way to get a hold of you? Do you have an email? Uh, yeah, sure. Email email address uh, do r r k nus Romeo Kilo November Uniform Sierra Sierra at cox c o x dot net. Okay, thank you. Sure. Yeah. And I do have other questions, but uh, since we're not open for questions, I'll hold those. Rod, okay. since we have you here, you know, we'll give you the opportunity to ask a question if you so choose. Okay. And uh, what what time frame do you actually put on the uh, events of Genesis one, and who is the original audience for that information? Genesis 1 to 11 coincides with the time period, let's see, that's Adam to Abraham, which coincides with the reign of the Sumerian kingdom in southern Mesopotamia from 4500 BC to about 2000 BC. Okay, so who then is the, would, would you say would be the original audience for Genesis? It's the body of Yahwists that were worshiping Yahweh. Okay, and, and, and so what we have as the book of Genesis has, you know, however you characterize it, that be written in Hebrew or, or, you know, possibly some in Aramaic, but what we have is, is the Hebrew version. Hebrew didn't come about until sometime in the middle of the second millennium BC. True. So would 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 you say that these were passed down as oral tradition then for thousands of years before first being recorded as writing? No, no. Uh, the remember I showed you in Genesis five one and two, uh, the date, the dating methodology. That is a writing formality invented by the Sumerians, which was also used by the neighboring Akkadians in a, a facet of writing on clay tablets called the colophon. And the colophon uh, consisted of, after they would write the narrative, whatever they would jot down, it consisted of a date and a name of the scribe or owner of the tablets. So, and the signature, obviously, name of the scribe or owner and a date, and also the title of what the documents were. And that's why we see in Genesis uh, 2, 1 through 2, 4, where it says, you know, in the day that God created heavens and the earth. And so there was another, any, in the day is a cue there. So uh, now this, the Yahweh's were Semitic. There were Semitic people living in and amongst the Sumerians, and they were called Akkadians. Uh, Akkad was a kingdom north of Sumer. However, they had a symbiotic relationship. There were Akkadians that lived with the Sumerians, and they actually held positions in temples. And were even rulers uh, for the Sumerian kingdom. So, so this, the Genesis one is about the Semitic people 
and who lived started at about 4500 BC. That's who the audience was, and it was written down in Akkadian, most likely Akkadian, on a clay tablet. And originally, it could, there's even some uh, discussion about it being on pictograph before writing was even invented. The Sumerians are credited with inventing writing in sometime around 3000 BC, and so uh, maybe maybe like 3300 BC, I think, like that. But but it's important, it had to be Akkadian because the Akkadians were Semitic and they used some influence from the Sumerian writing style, the Sumerian language. So, uh, so we can kind of get a very good feel of real historical facets behind Genesis 1. Uh, the actual tablets went through several iterations. Uh, one theory uh, put forth by uh, an author named P.J. Wiseman is that the tablets of containing the whole of Genesis 1 and 11 made their way out of Palace, out of Mesopotamia when Abraham migrated out of, Mes out of Mesopotamia to Haran and went down to Canaan. They eventually landed in a Egyptian library where Joseph did some editing on them. And so eventually they went through several iterations and landed on parchment. And uh, so I'm not saying that somebody wrote these downs, downs later, but there are signs in the text that they originally existed on clay tablets before they were put down in a book form on parchment or paper. Okay, so given, given that original audience then, how do we know how they would have understood this story? How do we know how they would have understood it? Well, it's a piece yes, of- because we, it, in other words, what, what I'm suggesting here is that throughout your presentation, and I, I you know, really enjoy your presentation. I know you put a lot of work into it, but in order to honor the very first precept that you indicated is honor audience relevance, the original audience, yes. then we cannot go to Matthew, to Isaiah, to Ezekiel, or to any of those other books that did not exist for thousands of years after this original audience was made aware of Genesis and try and decipher what those people would have thought when they read Genesis or was told that story. Yes, somewhat. I partially agree with, with your statement there. Uh, remember this it's a pre-philosophical culture they relied on on symbology very heavily to communicate concepts with with each other uh, obviously and but the best thing we can do is who is doing the writing who is the audience and what are the messages they're attempting to convey and and knowing that genesis 1 is a legal document that declares a person's citizen stat, citizenship status say that i am in the 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 city state for the Yahwist, or I'm in the community of Yahwist. This is what we believe. This is our creation story. And so it's a legal document in that respect. And that's probably what it was used for, like to, to separate them out. So, so obviously you can't go back and get into the heads of someone who lived 4,000 BC. I know I get your point there, certainly, but we can make an attempt to try to get our heads around on on the migration of all that. Now there's all kinds of different stories where Genesis, all the books of Genesis came from. But knowing that that in mind, they originally went on clay tablets and they spoke a language that I can't even try to speak, you know. Um, the best we can do is, is, is address who the original writers were and who their audience was and what the text was used for. Right, and I, I, I agree with that. And, and but in order to, to try and gain their understanding, don't we have to use then the the understanding of that contemporary audience, whether it is you know other cultures that uh, that existed at the same time period? Well, my only suggestion is that, and 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 my confusion is that it it just seems to me that we cannot go to these documents that were written thousands of years later and say, well, this is how the word was used in Matthew, so we can take that and apply it back to this ancient story and say, well, that's what it means. Can this be considered 
as far as, okay, like if you were to go to I, like Isaiah and how he prophesied about Jesus Christ, and that this was like quite, quite some time before it came into fulfillment. So if you were to use the consistency of the scripture and uh, correlate, you know, scripture, uh, uh, interpreting scripture, you can somewhat come to some, some conclusions that are, are, if not accurate, very close. Sure. Uh, I would, I guess, yeah, to kind of build on top of that thought there, I would say that even though Genesis was written prior to the time of the prophets, if we've identified Genesis as prophetic literature and we're understanding it in that form, I don't believe it would be erroneous to look to other later uh, prophetic literature and find similar understandings that were being developed. Uh, I think that we do do that with the New Testament. We look at the New Testament and we come, we've gained better understanding of things that were written far later. Uh, well, far we later. do, but we have the New Testament writers that specifically refer back to those Old Testament passages and tell us basically this is what it really means. Well, that's this is how it should be interpreted. Right, but, and we're saying the same. But thing. that original audience, and, and it's just like the, the you know the before the New Testament. And the, the Israelites, they believed that Messiah was going to restore them to the physical land, because right. that's that's how they understood it. And that's really, if you don't have the New Testament, that's the way anybody would that read those scriptures would understand them. But we have the New Testament writers that have come back and said, no, no, that's going to be fulfilled in Christ. So we know what that means. I guess all, all I'm saying is that when we make that precept about the how the original audience would have understood it, we need to we need to caveat that with, or at least understand that those original audience for Genesis one would not have understood it the way that we're trying to make it look. Well, no, would they have understood it the way the prophets? I think that was the question, right? That's what we were talking about there. Would the prophets have understood it the way that? The Genesis authors had under uh, had meant it, and, and well, vice versa. yeah, I, that all I'm saying is that I don't think it is a valid exegetical tool to go to the the New Testament and pick out words that are used in the New Testament and apply them back in Genesis, and then try and understand Genesis that same, using those same words. Oh, sure. And I, I, no, Genesis, it, no, that's, that's consistent. In the Bible, uh, the tools that we have today is the Bibles, and we have the Strong's Concordance, and some people go to extra great lengths to try to learn Hebrew. They, some people try to learn Sumerian and Akkadian languages to, to try to get in the heads of the original cultures, but, but the Bible is inconsistent. That's one thing that Covenant of Creation says, the Bible is consistent from beginning to end. The end matches the beginning. And so all the terminology throughout the whole thing applies uh, everywhere else. You know. So. Well, I, yeah, and I, I agree with that, but we have those tools. What I'm saying is that that original audience didn't have those tools. True. So what they, the, the original audience would not have understood Genesis the way that you just explained to us the way you understand Genesis. But if you notice, um, the Jewish people are the best record keepers that, that there were. And plus, um, like Pastor had mentioned, that the prophets and stuff like that, they are, you know, familiar with records you know, and um, genealogies and all of these things, you know, this is their culture. This is something that they, that they uh, take, uh, you know, to the extreme of, you know, of accuracy, you know, in their day. Yeah, you know if I may, I, I just wanna say this point here. Rod, let's, let's clarify for simplicity here where we agree. We agree that None of us should be leaning into the Bible and interpreting it our own way. So now that we've said that, we all believe, I think we agree, that we have to lean in on the way that those people at that time would have understood it. Now, the question you're asking seems to be a very similar question I get 
from futurists when I begin to try to force what they say as a preterist understanding of the New Testament. So again, as preterists, we know the way you better understand the understanding of the first century is by going back and looking at understanding through their lens. What we're asserting here is that what we're seeing in the prophets, what we're seeing in other literatures in the New Testament is how the ancients seemingly would have understood Genesis. Otherwise, we're at we're in a vacuum where we don't really know what it might be. And some have come to that conclusion. Here we are just trying to be consistent with the ethic of preterism and then carrying that backwards to what we're doing with Genesis. So yeah, okay, but and and just just to be clear here, I agree with th that Genesis is not about the creation of any th the physical earth. I mean, I'm in agreement on that. Where I'm trying to, what I'm trying to understand and, and be able to explain is this whole covenant creation concept that these animals, when, when Genesis talks about animals being created, no, 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 those aren't animals, those are people groups. And all I'm suggesting is that these Akkadians and these ancient Samaritans or, you know, the, the original people to whom this was originally communicated, I just don't think they would have understood those as people groups. They would have looked at that and understood it as being animals. Okay, well, I think we've we've given it, and, 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 and that's everyone. you know that that that's what I'm suggesting. We are going to to we are using documentation scriptures that came thousands of years later. To go back and and inform our understanding that these are people groups and not really animals, and they would not have had that information. That's what I'm suggesting. No, I think they actually would understand animal imagery as people groups because uh, we know from scripture that uh, they were foxes are Edomites and dogs are Philistine. You know those types of associations. And so I figured them out today. And well, that's true, but dogs are also dogs. Yeah, yeah well, absolutely. But in scripture, it, dogs are actually dogs. Yeah, yeah, that's science too. But that, that's the thing is that they use this imagery to describe uh, people. And so, so, yeah, I think we can reasonably, with the tools that we have a day today, we can make a reasonable attempt to do the best we can to try to discern some of this stuff and use it to interpret scripture. And yes, that includes the new Testament to help explain things in the old Testament. And if you can get your head around all the imagery, Genesis one and two, uh, what all that stuff means, then all the rest of the Bible will start to make a lot more sense. And just because to scripture. Us, go ahead. Yeah, I agree. I'm, I'm just, just say, I, you know, I, I, again, I agree, but I, I'm just trying to be consistent with the audience relevance thing. But if I you notice just, throughout scripture, throughout scripture, they use, uh, for various audiences, they use imagery like, uh, like uh, Randy was saying, uh, as far as pictorial pictures, you know, to describe something like they use something that exists to describe what they're saying, right? As far as you know, just to give you a, a a a picture of what they're trying to say. Well, yeah. Again, I you know, I'm just gonna say that I I think I think we've belabored the point here that it's far more than just taking of uh, you know, let's say terms in the New Testament and bringing them back to Genesis. I think we've also made the point, and I have plenty of resources I'll send to you, Rod, Rod that I've posted numerous times that you know, get into the point of, we first have to identify what Genesis 1 is. You know, what is it talking about? What is it telling us from that ancient Near Eastern perspective? And only then should we be willing to start talking about different terms that are found in the text. So I hope that we've kind of already done that. Again, it's been two weeks. I think we've provided a lot of resource and a lot of thoughts. It's not just some men getting together to grab some terms from the New Testament and apply no, them. I understand that. And, I, and, 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 you know, I've been following this all along. And we're just, just to kind of wrap this up very quickly here, what I'm, try, what I'm struggling with here is, is to, um, to try and compare in my own mind and understand in my own mind which view 
of Genesis makes more sense, and I can defend, in my mind, basically the, the functional role view proposed by John Walton, or this covenant creation view, and I recognize there's plenty of overlap between the two, sure. um, uh, uh, of, you know, beyond creation science and some of the things that, you know, Randall has, has advanced. And, and, and so I'm just trying to figure out which one of those is best, and maybe it's a combination. Yeah, I, I think probably so. <laughs> so, yeah. okay, right. well, I, I appreciate the time. I know I've kind of extended your show here a little bit but oh hey that's cool i appreciate you tuning in and I, I did see you here so thank you all right yes thank you very much thanks thanks rob all right so uh, again we here we are at the conclusion of our time and uh again there's a host of resources you know i do want to just make some quick uh closing thoughts randall i want to go ahead and just give you an opportunity to say some last things and edward you as well before i just give us a a rush through some resources and announcements well, okay. I just want to say goodbye from Kansas, and I really appreciate the opportunity to get to talk about these things. And I want to leave you with never stop studying. Yeah. Yeah. Amen. <laughs> so. That's right. How about you, Edward? Uh, any thoughts you want to share? Uh, any announcements or resources that you think need to be highlighted this flashback, flash forward Friday? Just, just be consistent in uh, searching, seeking, studying, and proving all things pertaining to to God, to the things of God, and that that we may consider, you know, uh, uh, things in the Bible are not always literal, you know. So, you know, we have to consider these things and look at the context and see how things unfold. And if you see inconsistencies, then, you know, we have questions and then possibly we can get answers. Amen. If I may add to that, you know, I have to do this. The Bible, <laughs> the, the things in the Bible are always literally what they're literally saying. They're not always literally what you think they're literally saying. Right. Uh, Amen. That's important. <laughs> um, so uh, that being said, let me just uh, offer up some flashback uh, resources. Again, we've provided three blogs on the power of preterism.wordpress.com chock full of resources, websites, articles, podcasts, everything you can think of uh, in this regard to preterism and creation. There's quite a few that lean in on just helping you get an understanding of what, what Randy was sharing about in regards to the ancient Near East and the tablets. For example, dstoner.net, a great resource that I regularly recommend in that regard. Uh, so there's a lot there that you can go ahead and look back to. I already mentioned the Promised Land of Lot uh, presentation by Tim Martin, which actually you can find at that Bible Mysteries uh, website that Randy had shared, and also the PDF file you can find at the power of preterism.wordpress. Both of those are available there. Uh, a resource I'm going to share a little bit later for a flashback is Frank Spear had done a lecture a couple of years ago on the serpent. And I saw that was shared earlier today in the Covenant Creation discussion forum. I thought it was a good we didn't get that far in our study uh, this week. However, uh, many of you know I've done, uh, I wrote a book called Wicked, where I leaned in on that study, and I've been a part of studies in regards to Satan for quite some time, the serpent, if you will, and uh, I'll share that resource and encourage everyone to uh, review it. Most of the resources, let me say this, not everything I share is something I necessarily agree with. Uh, most of the time, I don't agree with anything 100%, but rather they're resources that I hope uh, would contribute to what Randall had just said never stop studying. Uh, also, in that same vein, uh, I mentioned this before, uh, Gary DeMar recently debated Dr. Michael Brown in regards to Matthew 24. Some really interesting insights brought out in that debate. I encourage you to go find it on YouTube, listen to that debate, write down your notes and ask, well, how can we help both of these men find consistent theology? Direct them to the power of preterism, and uh, hopefully we can uh, help them out there. And uh, then, of course, uh, we mentioned the 2010 Covenant Creation uh, Conference uh, clips that we'll be able to upload soon. I know Randy and I have been in some discussion in that regard. Thank you for making them available. And also, we're still working toward Tim Martin's sermons uh, in regards to uh, the, the Covenant Community Church and what he had, post, uh, had provided in that regard. One last resource before a couple of announcements. Uh, if you go to my personal blog, mianogonewild.wordpress.com, what I have there is a blog into about preterism and creation. I shared some of my notes from when Randy, Jeff, and Tim had joined us a couple of weeks ago. One thing I want to recommend you might do is go there and print out the chart in regards to Genesis chapter one. 
print that chart out and go back and listen to the podcast we've been doing in this the, the, these last two weeks. Because again, today there was a lot mentioned about Genesis 1. Tim had brought out a lot. Randy had brought out a lot a couple of, you know, day, a week ago. So there was a lot there that I would encourage you to fill in those boxes. If not, you know, get a blank piece of paper for almost every verse and, and just start writing through the different thoughts and details that stand out to you. And uh, I think it'll benefit you much and you can just plug it into your, you know, your Bible. I know my Bible pages for Genesis 1 and 2 are starting to make me look like a crazy man. So, um, you know, I encourage you to get a chart of your own and not fall victim to that. So uh, all of those resources mentioned, a couple more announcements. Uh, this week to come, we're gonna focus on preterism and the church. I know we're looking, I'm looking to share a presentation on what I think we need to be doing to foster healthy churches and healthy discipleship in the preterist community. I know Jonathan Buttry will be joining with us, one of our directors here for the Power of Preterism Network and sharing about healthy churches. He's actually been doing a series at Holston PBU Church on that topic. And uh, we're gonna welcome his thoughts. And then I've conversed with Zach, who's a regular attendee here. We've talked about uh, fellowship. Ward Fenley mentioned fellowship and import the importance of a local church. I know Tim Martin shares some of my thoughts in that regard. Uh, so we're gonna get into that topic and, and really hope that we, uh, we develop some healthy thoughts for the preterist community in regards to the church, meaning the global church. And then of course, the local church and how you might be involved in that. Uh, speaking of such, Daniel Rogers will be preaching this coming Sunday at North Broad Church. I, I forget the exact topic. I believe, I forget what he's speaking about, but it looked interesting. And uh, uh, I encourage everyone to uh, tune into Daniel Rogers on Facebook and, and look for his resources. I'll be sharing that sermon through the Power of Preterism Network uh, for everyone to be encouraged and enriched. This coming Sunday, I'm actually beginning teaching through Thessalonians here at the Blue Point Bible Church. We'll be thinking through Thessalonians. You could visit our website at bluepointbiblechurch.org, and you can find out how to listen to our sermons and tune in, et cetera. Uh, then, of course, next Wednesday is Lent. I'll be putting together a resource for the Blue Point Bible Church where you could participate in one of two efforts or both. Uh, first is called Lent Madness. For those of you that like to laugh, like to learn a little bit about church history and need a challenge, uh, Lent Madness is actually a uh, organized like March Madness for basketball where you have uh, different saints teamed up against each other every day and you vote for them. You, you get admired by their story. You pray you know, through their story there. Hopefully you're implementing some things that were highlighted in their life as sainthood and you're putting it into effect in yours and you get to vote. And then at the end, you get to see uh, what other like-minded people were thinking like you as you go through each day, learning about different saints and voting for those different saints. Now, if you're looking for something a bit more serious, understood, uh, that's fine. What we also have is a 40 day uh, journey reading through the uh, five books of Moses. You know, Moses received the law on Mount Sinai for how many days? 40 days and 40 nights. So why not you receiving the same knowledge for 40 days and 40 nights as you go through your Lent reading. So we'll be making that available for you. Uh, again, great way to walk worthy of what we've been learning here in regards to Genesis. Uh, lastly, uh, I've been mentioning these conferences for quite some time. In March, March 26th through the 27th, in Holst, uh, Rogersville, Tennessee, we'll be rethinking the resurrection, and uh, we encourage you to join with us. April 2nd is a debate between Stephen Baisden and Steve Whitsett in regards to, or Steve Bazden and Stephen Whitsett, however you like to say their names, uh, in regards to the resurrection, I encourage you to tune into that. And then in April, April 23rd through the 24th, there is a conference and fellowship happening in Alabama. And I know I and Ward Fenley will both be speaking there, highlighting kingdom-minded thoughts and sovereign grace. That's what I have for announcements. I don't know if either one of you have something you'd like to add to my exhaustive list. Otherwise, I'll close us in prayer. No, I'm good. You mentioned this already, but I had gone to mianogonwild.wordpress.com and I had downloaded, you know, your notes on the preterism and Genesis creation. I just All right. To note that. Appreciate that you did that. Yes, I think that you did, and I encourage everyone else to do the same. Uh, let's go ahead and pray and close out. Mighty God, we do thank you for the opportunity to be gathered around your word, to be gathered around you, Lord to gain an understanding of how you have made yourself known from times past and ultimately, Lord, how you continue to make yourself known in times present. We magnify your name. We thank you for the covenant that you have created, Lord, uh, that we might fellowship with you, that we might know you, that we might see your face. 
And we pray that you would continue us uh, as we go through the weekend, Lord. We would be continually seeking, searching, and studying, and proving your word uh, that you might be glorified and we might be edified. We lift up our time as worship to you, Lord, and we praise you for the edification we receive. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Go in peace. God bless. Thanks, guys. See ya. You.